Alongside our famous individualism, there's another ingredient in the American saga. A belief that we're all connected as one people. If there is a child on the south side of Chicago who can't read, that matters to me even if it's not my child. If there's a senior citizen somewhere who can't pay for their prescription drugs and having to choose between medicine and the rent, that makes my life poor even if it's not my grandparent. It is that fundamental belief, I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's keeper, that makes this country work. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. One of the best investments to make in the U.S. is to buy housing units and rent them to other individuals in exchange for a monthly rent. This is one of the significant ways people attain housing, as around 36% of people rented their homes in 2019. Renting is an excellent alternative to owning a home for many people, as a mortgage is a big commitment and is much more expensive than rent. In the past couple of years, rents and mortgages have skyrocketed, with rents increasing 11.3% last year and mortgages going up at an even faster rate. These rent increases make it much harder for people to afford housing, despite it being a basic necessity. This is causing the homeless problem in the U.S. to get even worse than before, as homeless shelters are reporting wait lists doubling or tripling this year. These are troubling facts, and the current housing crisis raises essential questions about our country. Why should housing be locked behind a paywall? Why do we even tolerate the idea of homelessness in our country? Why do we treat housing as an investment meant to turn a profit instead of a fundamental human right? Depending on one's ethical beliefs, those questions may have different answers. Whether it be Aristotle's virtue ethics, Kant's duty-based ethics, or John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism, you may decide that it is morally acceptable to tolerate homelessness in society. The current housing system in the U.S. is unethical because it does not guarantee housing to everyone and treats housing as a commodity instead of a fundamental human right. From a utilitarian perspective, this current housing system is likely absurd. John Stuart Mill's conception of utilitarianism can best be described as follows. Mill's version of utilitarianism added, a, added an important qualification to Bentham's purely quantitative analysis. Mill said it is not only the quantity of pleasures that counts, but the quality as well. There are way more renters than landlords, as over a third of the country has to pay rent to a landlord. Of that third, 17% of adult renters in 2020 were not caught up on rent, or roughly 13 million people. A total of 10.3 million people also reported owning rental properties in 2018. This means that a larger quantity of renters are struggling with rent compared to the number of people with rental properties who are profiting from a system that forces people to pay if they want their necessities. Under, under Stuart Mill's utilitarian philosophy, this would make rental houses unethical based on quantity. It would also be immoral based on the quality of pleasure too, since if housing were guaranteed, all renters in the U.S. would not have to worry about the threat of home, homelessness at the expense of the individuals and businesses with rental properties simply having less money. This, in my opinion, is the soundest ethical theory. Utilitarianism has a clear purpose, to make society as humane as possible, and Stuart Mill's idea of it also factors in the quality of happiness. This is to avoid certain absurd situations, such as the idea that it would be better to live as a pig than a human. My philosophy is rule utilitarianism, where specific rules are established that are most likely to increase human happiness. For example, do not kill innocent people is an excellent rule to serve a utilitarian purpose because it benefits everybody to live in a society where you are safe from the threat of being murdered at any time. Another way to view the dilemma is through Immanuel Kant. To put it as simply as possible, Kant views morality as more rigid and universal. He believes in what he calls the categorical imperative, a universal law that applies under all circumstances and is one we are obligated to follow to perform our duties. We also must follow the categorical imperative with the good intentions, or maxims, as it is not enough to simply perform our duties. An example of the categorical imperative would be do not murder or do not steal. According to Kant, these are, things, these are duties that everyone under all circumstances must follow. The categorical imperative, he says, is natural to all men, and the ultimate categorical imperative, or the golden rule, can be best simplified as do unto others as you would have done unto you. This means that for something to be a moral law, it must apply to everybody. For example, murder is immoral because we would not want everyone to be able to murder everyone else. To kill another person would be to make an exception for yourself to the golden rule, even though the rule applies regardless of circumstances. In Kant's philosophy, 
Purchasing property for profit is not acceptable. The mere goal of profit violates one of the categorical imperatives that Kant himself lays out, which is not to use people. To quote Kant, Accordingly, the practical imperative will be as follows, so as to treat humanity whether in thine own person or in that of any other in every case as an end with all, never as a means only. To purchase property for profit is to use humanity as an end in itself by putting a price tag on a basic necessity, especially one so high that not everyone can afford it. This is a textbook violation of one of Kant's categorical imperatives, which is not to use people or use them as a means to an end. In addition, buying housing units to rent out to others for profit is not universal. Every person on the planet will not have the ability to do this, as not everyone has the money to do so, and there are not enough additional housing units for everybody to own and rent out to each other. Another way of viewing this issue is through Aristotle. Aristotle's ethics surrounds virtue, which he simply defined as a rational activity per a sensible principle as he explains, quote, Virtue, accordingly, is rational activity, activity by a rational principle. Having defined virtue in this way, Aristotle can then defend, for example, courage as a virtue by showing that the courageous man is more rational than the coward. Aristotle also considers happiness the ultimate end, which he defines as living according to rationality. Aristotle established a list of socially defined virtues that must be followed to be considered virtuous and followed with good intentions. This means that being virtuous or moral is up to the individual. It is also vital to know Aristotle's golden means which means you cannot have too much or too little of one virtue. For example, one should not be too friendly because someone who is friends with everyone is not worth being friends with at all. And someone who is not friendly at all, as being friendly is still critical to a good life. Given these ethical principles, Aristotle would not have an inherent issue of people renting out housing for profit. In American society, entrepreneurship is considered a virtue, as 94% of Americans believe it is important to America's future that citizens have a fair opportunity to start and grow their businesses. As with all virtues, it is important to be within their golden mean. One could argue that people are too entrepreneurial in our society, giving themselves a complete disregard for humanity, and, as Kant would put it, using humanity as an end in itself. A survey of 148 legal aid and civil rights attorneys found a 35% increase in illegal evictions or lockouts compared to pre-pandemic levels, and 44% of participants reported an increase in evictions of tenants in public housing for non-payment. As well as this, an eviction stays on the public record for seven years and may even affect one's credit score, making it much harder to rent a new home after being evicted. These inhumane and selfish practices make American society much too focused on profit to the point where it, to where it tolerates such practices that put money in the hands of landowners over protecting people's fundamental human rights. Aristotle would see this as too entrepreneurial and, su and suggests that the law be changed to allow for public housing and lower rent to an amount that people can afford comfortably. This would put the U.S. in the golden mean of entrepreneurship. There are a lot of problems with Aristotle's ethics, though, mainly that it is very elitist, as Aristotle believes that only some people can genuinely be happy which in his time were Greek citizens. That means that women, children, slaves, and anyone not born Greek are incapable of happiness and exist solely to perform their obligations. This means that his ethical system is not universally applicable to everyone, making it pointless and highly outdated in modern times. The soundest moral system, in my opinion, is a version of utilitarianism called rule utilitarianism. Rule utilitarianism establishes rules that are most likely to increase happiness for the most amount of people. For example, the law do not steal would increase the happiness of more people than not because we would rather live in a world in which everyone is not stealing from everybody else since we would not want to be stolen from ourselves. Rule utilitarianism is, a very, sim is very similar to Kant's when it comes to the universality and basis and reason of its laws. Still, the rules in rule utilitarianism are more grounded in something real, as opposed to the categorical imperatives in Kant. While rule utilitarianism is grounded in the quantity and quality of happiness for as many people as possible, Kant claims to me that we must not use humanity as an end in itself, and that the will's intention trumps the virtuous deed. This creates issues because Kant does not acknowledge exceptional circumstances, so Kant's claim can lead to some absurd conclusions. Humans are a social species, so to varying extents we will always use others. There are ways to use others that are acceptable and that benefit both sides, such as a job, and wrong ways to use others, other people, including manipulation for one's advantage. The idea that intentions trump virtuous action is also questionable. Hypothetically, if someone accidentally came across the cure for cancer, 
Would we not be able to give credit to that person since it was not their intention to cure cancer? As well as that, since the categorical imperative applies regardless of all circumstances, it is easy for Kant to contradict specific rules. The most common hypothetical scenario used to critique Kant is the example of lying to a murderer that is asked you about the whereabouts of their victim. If you lie to the murderer about the victim's whereabouts, you have lied, violating a categorical imperative. But if you tell the truth about the victim's whereabouts, you are an accomplice to murder, and murder violates a categorical imperative. This situation makes it impossible to follow one's duties properly, and rule utilitarianism helps to solve that issue. It would be moral to lie to the murderer about their victim's whereabouts because, in this circumstance, the rule do not murder would trump the law do not lie. In this circumstance, the lie would prevent a murder and that would substantially lower the quality of happiness of the victim compared to the uh, potential pleasure gained from the murderer because the victim will be dead. In this case, lying to protect someone from murder is the best case scenario. Whether it be John Stuart Mill or Kant, both would agree that the current housing system in the U.S. is highly unethical. It does not guarantee the fundamental right to housing that all human beings ought to have because that would create the most happiness for the most people. The U.S. makes renters pay an average of 32% of their income on rent, which is too much for something that everybody needs to survive, and such, and such high prices make millions of Americans vulnerable to, extinct, to eviction. Evictions also make it harder to find a new place, as evictions stay in a person's public record for seven years. This makes future landlords more distrustful of a person, as well as the fact that an eviction may harm a person's credit score if they were evicted for non-payment. Overall, the housing market needs to be drastically changed to eliminate its exploitative and inhumane nature. One of the harshest critics of the American housing system is Hakeem, a socialist YouTuber who makes videos advocating for socialist slash progressive causes. He made two videos explaining why he believed landlords are exploitative and uphold an unjustified system that, that, that disproportionately harms the poor and minorities. After watching these two videos, I took away that Hakeem and other extreme left-wingers put too much emphasis on landlords themselves and don't see the bigger picture in terms of the current housing crisis. The rest of this video will be an, an analysis of Hakeem's perspective on this issue as a far-left commentator, discussing what I agree and disagree with when it comes to an extreme left solution to this issue. One of Hakeem's main arguments is that landlords are parasitic middlemen that stop certain people from being able to obtain housing or to do so but not comfortably. While it is a reasonable opinion to hold when you see rent skyrocketing and rampant homelessness in large cities, these things are an issue with the broader system and are not inherent to landlords as an institution. If we implemented policies that allowed people to work dignified jobs with high pay and a strong union, if we had tuition-free colleges that are accessible to all, if we ended the drug war and established a universal health care system that was free at the point of service, and even if we implemented reforms to the way we do housing which lowered rent and also gave people a public option to have a house, then you would see the idea of having to pay a monthly rent for housing wouldn't be that consequential of a thing for people, especially in a world I just described where people are living dignified lives and have a, ch a true choice to not rent. Now I wanted to make the argument, why would somebody even rent in the society if you could afford a house? And even if you couldn't afford a house, a public house would be provided for you. The answer is, renting has many pros that owning a home does not have, such as the fact that it is easy to move around if you travel a lot, and it is a lot easier to move if you wish to do so. Not everybody wants to be in the same place their entire lives, and life circumstances sometimes even force one to move to a different location. This is a luxury that, even, that can be, even be enjoyed at all income levels, as it is not only the poor that rent. According to Pew Research, around 10.5% of people in the income quartile of 75 to 100 rent a home. In addition, around 3.9% of people in the 90 to 100 net worth percentile rent a home, and 6.9% of the in the 75 to 89.9 net worth percentile, and 10.2% in the 50 to 74.9 net worth percentile rent. While these numbers seem small, they show that people of all income levels can potentially see the benefits of renting. While it is true that in a society I'm describing where people's socioeconomic needs are dealt with, renting privately would be much less frequent. It would still hold a place in society as a valid option available to people who want it, and that it gives people true freedom to assess their situation and decide for themselves what they would prefer to do. Hakeem's analysis is also flawed in the sense that he is only talking about large businesses or wealthy people that own huge swaths of properties, and seems to believe that they play a larger role in the housing market than they actually do. 
Pew Research found that, quote, the Census Bureau counted nearly 20 million rental properties, with 48.2 million individual units in its 2018 rental house finance survey. The most recent one conducted, individual investors owed nearly 14.3 million of these properties, or 71.6%, compromising almost 19.9 million units, or 41.2% of all units. For-profit businesses of various sorts owned 3.7 million properties, or 18.8%, but their holdings totaled 21.7 million units, or 45% of the total. Entities such as housing cooperative organizations and nonprofits owned smaller shares of the total. Individuals plus housing co-ops and nonprofits hold the same share of the housing market as large businesses do. To strengthen the point, the vast majority of landlords are individuals holding between one to four units. To put it into context, if you were to try to randomly select a landlord anywhere in the country, there is a 70.5% chance that it is a single person that owns a 1-4 to four unit property and not some extremely wealthy person or business. This shows that the problems that Hakeem is pointing out specifically aren't as big as he thinks, and he has stated this, his issue isn't with individuals that own few units. Funnily enough, Hakeem cites the exact Pew Research website that I have just cited twice which makes me question if he just didn't scroll all the way down, read it and interpret it differently, or just ignored it in bad faith, which I'm not willing to believe. Another pro of renting is that since the home is not theirs, they are not responsible for any maintenance and damages that are done unto the property. The damages are paid for by the landlord, who is the real owner of the property. Being a landlord or having a joint investment in a property would also still be a good way to make money or set up a comfortable retirement fund for the future. So it is a reasonable agreement for both sides, one wanting financial reward and the other wanting a flexible housing situation. To give Hakeem credit, he is absolutely correct when he says that the current way in which we distribute housing can be exploitative for tons of people in this country and that we shouldn't treat housing as a purely speculative asset that people use to turn a profit and think of it more as something that people need to survive. He is also correct that we should do what it takes to guarantee housing although Hakeem and I have different methods of doing so. Hakeem's method of completely socialized public housing is one-size-fits-all and is more vulnerable to logistical issues. I prefer a system where people have the choice to rent or buy privately, but if need be, or if one wants a public home, that should be available for them. This will make it so that everyone receives adequate housing, adequate housing, but if someone prefers a different method of, of obtaining a house or whatever circumstance they may be in, that is also fine. This will also make rents lower as there will be other systems of obtaining housing competing with them and ordinary people will be empowered to bargain for a fair price that suits them. Rents can also be lowered by deregulation in the form of easing zoning laws, something proven and well documented to decrease rents. Give an example, the Library of Economics and Liberty published a critique of a study titled Housing Constraints and Spatial Misallocation, done by Chang, Tai Hetz, and Enrico Moretti. This study attempts to determine the loss in GDP due to restrictions on the supply of new housing in certain major cities, and subsequently analyze the loss in average workers' wages due to this loss of productivity. While the study does show pretty drastic negative effects, the author of the criticism, Brian Kaplan, critiques the study even further and points out simple mathematical errors to confirm that the effects of zoning laws are even more drastic than stated in the, in the original Aish Moretti study. Kaplan's math suggests that changing zoning laws in the cities of New York, San Jose, and San Francisco compared to the median U.S. city would boost GDP by around 14-36% to and wages by a total of $1.3 trillion to $3.4 trillion. In addition to that, studies done by the Cato Institute and NBER found that all forms of land use regulations have been the dominant factor in making housing expensive and that zoning has been associated with real average home prices increasing in 13, 36 states. Landlords do not want to zone, because it is much more profitable to increase development and open up more properties so that they can rent out to more people. It is more profitable to rent out to more people for less amount of money per person. Hakeem also mentioned slumlords, who are typically wealthy people or businesses that attempt to maximize profits by renting out low standard properties in low income, rundown communities to people they believe they can intimidate and, sp and minimize spending on maintenance as much as possible. This is, as I and Hakeem would both agree, a disgusting practice that has no place in a civil society. However, slumlords are a product of the broad broader system we live in. If people are simply able to live dignified lives and not have to deal with poverty and other socioeconomic problems that bring people down, 
then slum lords would cease to exist, since there would be no poor people to bully and force into submission, since the people would be empowered. To talk more about what I and Hakeem agree on, which he mentioned in his two videos on landlords, that one, the risk is not a valid reason to claim that one deserves profit, and two, something being voluntary does not make it moral or something that, could, that should continue to take place. There are drug kingpins and human traffickers that take risks when operating their illegal and extremely immoral businesses, but nobody would argue that they should be able to keep the money that they've made or operate business, businesses because of the risks that they have taken. As well, politicians and businesses voluntarily engage in corruption and bribery, and, it, and, and this voluntarily practice that they engage in. That doesn't mean it's good or something that should continue. In addition, it is an unfortunate occurrence that many people have to pay huge swaps of their monthly income on rent, which can be fixed via many solutions that would lower rents and increase the income of individuals so that nobody has to pay that much on rent and can live in a better quality home. Hakeem's solution is also in part a good thing in the sense that we should use public housing as part of an effort to guarantee everybody a home no matter what. Hakeem also seems to assume that all homeless people are homeless simply because they cannot afford a home at their current location. While it's likely that most homeless people are there simply because housing is too expensive for them, it is also true that research has shown rates of schizophrenia among the homeless population to be as high as 20% with other research showing the rates of severe mental illness in general to be around 20-25%. to 25%. When we talk about the homeless population, we must be careful not to simply look at it from an economic perspective. Some people simply have failed to obtain the treatment that they need and should be sent to a hospital and get help. And only until they have the treatment necessary and potentially day-to-day -day assistance by a professional should a house be provided for this person by the state. At this point, they can get a job, and if they please, potentially rent or purchase a home of their own volition. This is something that would benefit a landlord, as homeless people are in no way, shape, or form profitable for landlords. Hakeem in his video also understands the fact that individual landlords are not at fault, but it is a broader systemic issue that needs to be addressed. This is confusing because if Hakeem accepts this premise, then it logically follows that the problems associated with housing in our country are not inherent to landlordism, and that a healthy dynamic is possible. On to a different point, Hakim also seems to believe that everywhere there is a socialist slash communist experiment, they are able to eliminate homelessness. While it is very difficult to figure out how many people in the, in the USSR were experiencing homelessness, or if there was any perpetual homelessness, we do know that Soviet housing was often inadequate for people's circumstances, or just purely low quality in general. To quote Mervyn Matthews' book, Poverty in the Soviet Union from 1986, he describes the reasons why the USSR had such difficulty with housing, quote, A system such as this, oriented toward the provision of standard amounts of housing for all, with strict financial restraints, might be regarded as protective of poor people's interests. One might further imagine the relationship between poverty and slum dwelling, so characteristic of capitalist lands, would be weakened. This has not happened for several cogent reasons. Firstly, Soviet towns have always been characterized by acute housing shortages from which most people suffer. Secondly, the provision of superior accommodation has long been used as a reward for service to the state, or as an incentive to work harder. The sharp fall in the per capita provision of urban housing during the first five year plans, for example, necessitated special provisions for managers and outstanding workers. The destruction wrought by the Second World War and the, and the neglect of the sector in the post-war decade had the same effect. The Khrushchev leadership in, in, endeavored to increase housing stocks, but it still had to urbanize rapidly in the interest of economic growth, and most housing privileges were retained. When the rate of urbanization began to slow in the mid-60s, the housing sector, though lacking the variety found in the capitalist society, was still characterized by a good deal of differentiation. The Brezhnev leadership adopted a highly protective attitude in most forms of privilege and maintained the existing accommodation benefits. Thirdly, the allocation system has over time developed subtle inf informal mechanisms which worked to the detriment of the less privileged citizens. The poor, for instance, have fewer chances of acquiring better quality accommodation erected by powerful organizations or enterprises and are more likely to end up in meaner flats belonging to local Soviets. Poor people cannot usually buy a living space in cooperative housing projects because, compared with the normal rents in the state sector, such housing is extremely expensive. If they do so, the space they acquire is, to judge from our sample returns, close to the minimum, and mortgage repayments greatly exacerbate their financial difficulties. 
the poor have less of the political influence needed to speed progress through the local waiting lists. The problem of Soviet slums has, of course, always been veiled in secrecy. The term like poverty still cannot be officially ascribed to any Soviet dwelling, but such dwellings continue to exist and are likely to house the poorest members of society. In other words, there were special accommodations given the people that serviced the state, and housing was often given as an incentive to work harder. This caused there to be large amounts of stratification in terms of the housing that was received among citizens, with the poor not having enough money or political power to attain better housing than they were given. To strengthen this point, around 60% of Soviet citizens thought that their living space was either inadequate or grossly inadequate. This was the case because, in 1975, huge swaths in the USSR did not have the basic amenities that we take for granted in the West, such as sanitation, hot and cold water, and central heating. The graph on the screen shows the gross inequalities between the access to these services based on the settlement size of a settlement. The USSR was not heavily invested in smaller towns that the poor masses lived and worked in, and focused more on where its wealthier citizens resided. The point is, it may or may not have been true that every single Soviet citizen had a home, but these homes were terrible and tons of them that poor people lived in can barely be considered homes to proper standards. It would be like if the U.S. tried to solve homelessness by granting every single homeless person in the U.S. a tent or a wooden shed. Hakim continues to say that landlords do not work over and over again, which sounds concerning, but in reality, if one's ethics are derived from utilitarianism, it wouldn't necessarily matter as long as the landlord provides a good outcome, which they do when they provide a valid alternative to owning a home that has its unique pros to it. As long as the landlord is doing something that improves the human happiness of a person compared to other outcomes, do not need to work to make a legitimate claim that they are benefiting society. As I mentioned before, the vast majority of landlords are individuals that own one to four units. Hakim also mentions that there have been reports of landlord misconduct, such as sexual favors in exchange for being able to stay in a home. While these are absolutely horrendous, it again speaks to broader issues that aren't inherent to the institution. If people had the ability to be lifted out of poverty and be emboldened in their daily lives, then landlords would not be given that kind of power over a person as people would be more free in where they choose to live and who they choose to pay rent to. When you give power to the people, those things don't happen, and if they do, they are prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. The last counter-argument I'm going to make is a response to he Hakim pointing out that many government officials in the U.S. and abroad are landlords themselves and own properties. He obviously said this in order to make the case that it would be very difficult to make progress to solve homelessness given the current people in power. A couple of things to point out is that, the question becomes how many of these are just one to four unit homes for one's retirement, and how much does this influence the, the decisions that they make? After all, they still need to appeal to the people's wishes in order to be re-elected. Another point is that Americans as of right now are shifting more and more left, according to polls that asking people if they have become more liberal or conservative over time on certain issues, and if they have changed their mind on something. This means that we can elect new people to replace the Washington insiders and the ghouls that are currently in power, something that Hakim would probably think cannot happen because of this assumption that the ruling class controls everything and that the people have no power, which is a separate conversation. To conclude the point, the people can make a change if they really rally enough and fight for what they want and elect the right people since, again, elected officials still need to do what the people want to a certain degree to maintain power. That concludes this video. If you have any criticisms of what I've said, leave them in the comments and like the video if you enjoyed it. Also make sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification.